Hello everyone! Today's screencast is all about bonding, the three types of primary bonding and van der Waals bonding, also how bond strength affects a material's properties. So if you want to, you can pause the video and pick the topic that you want to using the annotations to the right. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy the screencast. Many of a material's properties such as melting point, elastic modulus, and coefficient of thermal expansion are directly related to the type of bonding that it has. We need to be able to differentiate between the types of bonding in order to better understand why materials with certain bonding have certain properties. There are three types of primary bonding, ionic, covalent, and metallic. This diagram over here demonstrates metallic bonding. Metallic bonding occurs in metals, as the name suggests. In metallic bonding, each metal atom donates its outer shell electrons to a shared electron C. So the dash is right over here. And each metal atom becomes a positively charged core. So all of these guys have positive charges on them. The electrons are free to move because they do not stay attached to any one metal core. But they do act like a glue to keep the metal together. A common misconception as shown in this diagram down here, is that only protons float in the electron C. However, it is positively charged metal cores or metal cations that are in the electron C, as shown here. So this would be iron plus. Now, metallic bonds in general are less strong than, o, than ionic or covalent bonds, but are stronger than secondary van der Waals bonds. Here we have some bonding energies and some melting temperatures for some given metals. Notice that there is a direct correlation between the bonding energies and the melting temperatures for the metal. So the higher the bonding energy, or bond strength, the higher the melting temperature, as shown by the three given metals. Um, as a final note, metals make up a lot of the periodic table. Metals are found in this gray section. They are found here and here and here in this brown section and over here also. So they do make up a majority of the periodic table and they all have metallic bonding. The second type of primary bonding is ionic bonding. Ionic bonds are generally the strongest type of bond and occur in some ceramics. Now, in ionic bonding, one atom transfers electrons to another atom, creating two oppositely charged ions. The attraction between the positive and negative ions is what holds the material together. Now, shown here is the formation of sodium chloride, or table salt. The sodium atom donates its lone valence electron to the chlorine, which needs one more electron to fill its valence shell, forming Na plus and Cl minus, and then they then stick together because of the opposite charges. So, ionically bonded solids have a crystal lattice structure as shown here in the diagram. Again, that is sodium chloride. The very high bond strength of ionic solids is what accounts for the high melting temperature and high elastic modulus of ionically bonded ceramics. Ionic bonds generally occur between metals and nonmetals. So nonmetals are over here on the periodic table, this part over here, and metals are generally here, here, in the middle, and down here. So metals and nonmetals have a large electronegativity difference, which causes the ionic bonding. Electronegativity, in general, is highest over here and lowest over here, so it increases that way, towards here. So, if, as a general rule, if the atoms are far apart on the periodic table, and both are not metals, then they most likely form ionic bonds. The third and final type of primary bonding is covalent bonding. Now, covalent bonds are very close in strength to ionic bonds, but in general are a little bit weaker than them. They occur when two or more atoms share, they share valence electrons to complete their outer shells. They, in general, occur between two nonmetals, which are over here, down there, on the periodic table. 
there are three types of covalent bonding, 0D, 1D, and 3D covalent bonding. 0D covalent bonding occurs in small molecules, such as fluorine gas. Other examples of 0D covalent bonding are carbon dioxide, methane, or water. However, these materials are generally not as important as 1D or 3D bo covalent bonding to engineers. In 3D covalent bonding, we this occurs in ceramics. These ceramics behave similarly to the ionically bonded ceramics. Both have high melting temperature and elastic modulus, but have a low coefficient of thermal expansion because of the high bond strengths. Also, both of them have a crystal lattice structure right here, as shown in diamond. Now, 1D covalent bonding has different properties than 0D or 3D covalent bonding and is associated with polymers. Remember, 1D equals polymers. Okay, we're talking about polymers. So, 1D covalent bonds are very long chains of covalently bonded molecules, as shown in this diagram over here. These zigzag lines represent the 1D covalent bondage. And a polymer, by definition, is a material made of long chains of 1D covalently bonded molecules held together by secondary bonding. So these red lines, called van der Waals bonding, which leads us out of covalent bonding and into secondary type of bonding, which is called van der Waals bonding. Secondary bonding, also collectively known as van der Waals bonding, is much weaker than the three types of primary bonding. Van der Waals bonding accounts for the unique properties in polymers, which is very important to remember. Van der Waals bonds, unlike the three primary bonds, do not directly involve outer electron interaction. By definition, van der Waals bonds are weak forces between molecules caused by dipoles being attracted to one another. Now, here we have the definition of dipole. A temporary or permanent dipole occurs in a molecule when the electrons become unbalanced, meaning that they are not evenly distributed in the molecule's electron cloud. Temporary dipoles occur randomly. As stated previously, electrons are free moving and sometimes they clump together for an instant by chance, like right here. When they clump together, they create a slightly negative charge where they are, so negative charge, and a slightly positive charge on the other side of the molecule where they are not. Now, the electrons in this clump repel the electrons in the molecule next to them, which starts a chain reaction. So, it starts a chain reaction of forcing dipoles to happen. The slightly positive charge ends are attracted to the slightly negative charge ends, causing weak van der Waals bonds to form between the molecules. Right here, like that, and like that. Now, permanent dipoles occur for a number of reasons. The most common reason is a difference in electronegativity. Electronegativity is a measure of how much an element attracts electrons to itself. The more electronegative the element, the more the element attracts electrons to itself. So it's kind of an electron greediness, if you would. Earlier we said that a large electronegativity difference leads to ionic bonding. However, sometimes atoms in covalent bonds have an electronegativity difference too, but not enough to be considered an ionic bond. An example of this is hydrochloric acid, or HCl. The chlorine is more electronegative than the hydrogen, so the electrons spend more time with the chlorine than with the hydrogen. This creates a partial negative charge on the chlorine and a partial positive charge on the hydrogen. As a final note, van der Waals bonds caused by temporary dipoles are generally weaker than those caused by permanent dipoles. Now that we know all about dipoles that cause van der Waals bonding, we can now discuss polymers. Van der Waals bonds are what hold a polymer together, as shown by this diagram here. Right here, we have the 1D covalently bonded chains, and between them, van der Waals bonding occurs. The van der Waals bonds act as glue between the chains. 
In other words, Van der Waals bonds hold the polymer chains together. And this is important. Van der Waals bonds are what determines a polymer's melting point, coefficient of thermal expansion, elastic and elastic modulus. So remember that well. And in comparison to the other types of bonds, Van der Waals bonds are less strong, much less strong <laughs> than metallic bonds, which are less strong than covalent bonds, which are less strong than ionic bonds, as shown by this little flow chart right over here. I know, after this long video, you're probably wondering, why do I care about bonding? As engineers, we generally care about how a material behaves on the large scale. The reason we care about bonding is because bonding directly affects a material's melting point, coefficient of thermal expansion, and elastic modulus. This chart shows three example materials, a polymer, a metal, and a ceramic. As we can see, the ceramic has the highest elastic modulus and melting temperature, but lowest coefficient of thermal expansion. This is because ionic or 3D covalent bonding is stronger than metallic or van der Waals bonding. Now, the given material does have 3D covalent bonding for your information. On the flip side, the polymer has the lowest elastic modulus and melting temperature, but the highest coefficient of thermal expansion. This is because van der Waals bonds are secondary bonds, which are weaker than the three types of primary bonds. And as stated previously, van der Waals bonds are what control these three properties of polymers because they are what holds the material together. Finally, we can see that the values for the metal fall in between the values of the other two. This is because the bond strength in metallic bonding is stronger than that of van der Waals bonding, but weaker than that of 3D covalent or ionic bonding. To summarize, we can see that higher bond strength leads to higher elastic modulus and melting temperature, but lower coefficient of thermal expansion. And lower bond strength leads to a lower elastic modulus and melting temperature, but a higher coefficient of thermal expansion. So, to put this into context of the materials, the van der Waals bonding in polymers is much less than the metallic bonding in metals, which is much less than the 3D covalent or ionic bonding in ceramics. I hope this video has been useful to understanding the bonding types, how the bonding types relate to the three primary classes of engineering materials, and how bond strength affects the macroscopic properties that engineers care about. So, thanks for watching. If you would like more information about bonding, here are some other YouTube videos that cover some of the topics that we talked about today. Also, in the description, there are some outside links to some outside sources so you can learn more about the bonding topic that you choose. Thanks again for watching.